Welcome to the MyCareens Mastery Podcast. I'm your host, Jonah Krokmalden. Together, we'll explore the art of turning tiny seeds into a thriving MyCareens empire, sharing insights, coveted secrets, and strategic wisdom from building one of Canada's largest MyCareens farms. Stay tuned for thought-provoking conversations with leading figures in the world of MyCareens. Welcome to the podcast, everyone. On today's episode, we have Kyle Weiler from Ransom Farms, formerly known as Desert Kitchen Gardens from Phoenix, Arizona. On this episode, we'll dive into some really great mindset hacks for farmers and entrepreneurs, strategy around time management, Kyle's expansion plans, and using long-term thinking to transform how you operate and grow your business. This is a really insightful episode full of knowledge you can apply to your business. So let's get right into it. Welcome to the podcast, Kyle. I'm really excited to have you on and share your story. Thanks so much for having me. I'm excited. Awesome. So yeah, let's let's get right into it. So I'd love to hear how you kind of first got interested in microgreens and the backstory of how Ransom Farms came to be. So I got really into gardening here in the desert. We're in Phoenix, Arizona, and I just started consuming uh, all the YouTube videos and everything I could learn about gardening, probably in like 2015, 2016. Um, I had a community garden plot and, you know, I was just learning as much as I could. And of course, I came across Curtis Stone in doing all the YouTube research. And uh, just I had this desire to leave my job as a pharmacist and become like a market gardener. But the more research I did, um, it, it was very hard to take that go from that high salary to making maybe 17 grand for the next three years at, while working 80 hours a week and then, you know, trying to start planning a family and all that. So it just wasn't really feasible where I was at in my life. Um, and then I had actually read Curtis's book, The Urban Farmer. And in that book, he talks about, um, you know, different urban farm plot sizes that you could start and how many hours it would require you to work and how much you could earn in a 30 week season. And um, there was, uh, if you were to work 40 hours a week uh, for 30 weeks uh, doing that market farming, you would make maybe 30 grand in that first season. Um, but, and so again, that was 40 hours. But then he also said, if you were to add microgreens, you could double that amount, but that would require an additional 15 hours. So right there i saw there was leverage in labor because you can make the same amount of money working like a third of the amount of time um and then i just started to think what if i did it full time what if i did it all year round you know and that's the beauty of microgreens and growing indoors um, uh, you know the way that most of us are doing it and then i think the real linchpin for me was seeing his video of uh david from micro acres or he was doing 20 grand in his basement and selling to restaurants. And I was like, okay, this is like, this is a mental model that I can like see how I could get there for myself. And uh, Dave historically was, you know, making somewhat similar what I was annually um, in his professional career. So again, there was a model for me to take that step and jump into it. Awesome. Yeah. I, I think that's something that people don't necessarily realize in the microcosm of farming, of how much more accessible microgreens are from a business perspective to actually replace your income compared to you know market gardening or growing mushrooms or all the other sort of you know big scale ag, uh, it, it's it's really a really unique opportunity for people. And uh, I, I was I was kind of in in a similar boat in that I really wanted to to grow food, I really wanted to farm, but uh, like I didn't see a viable path. But I got to a point where I was like, I really just want to grow food. That's what I love to do. So I tried doing the market garden kind of thing on a, on a pretty small scale. And yeah, like you said, like the amount of hours you have to work and the time commitment, it's just the numbers don't add up, especially, you know, as cities have gotten more and more expensive to live in the last few years. So microgreens just make it so much more viable and doable to actually uh, have a career out of it, which is, which is really great. So when did you start? growing microgreens and what you're kind of at now yeah so i had done a bunch of research i had taken a couple little courses and stuff on microgreens and read some free ebooks and all that stuff and i just was like so locked up in like all these little decisions you have to make to get started because you want to do everything perfectly when you get started before you invest in equipment and stuff and it was just really challenging 
you know, there's so much free information. Like you can, you can spend time to get there and figure it out yourself. However, I, I'm a firm believer in education and, you know, skipping the learning curve by paying somebody a couple hundred dollars to, you know, give me kind of a blueprint on how to do things. So I'd reached out to Dave at Micro Acres and, uh, you know, we did like three phone calls and kind of gave me the basics on seating and, uh, you know, price points and how to approach chefs and all that stuff. And I would say about 80% of what we do is based off of, you know, where I started from with him. And I think that's a feasible way for people to get started is just, that's not going to take you all the way to a giant business, but it's going to at least get you on the ground running to where you can get experience and start figuring things out yourself. So for that sure. was January 20, sorry, that was January, 2020 that I reached out to Dave and I had started doing sales outreach and uh, chef meetings in uh, like mid to late February of that year. I got two, no, sorry, I got one restaurant client and then the pandemic shut everything down. So I think I did like two deliveries and then all the restaurants were closed. And that was like my whole plan was to sell the restaurants. So um, it wasn't a great time. I never got paid. Uh, I had just ended up donating my microgreens to them because all these you know, restaurant staff were losing their jobs and stuff. So um, I shut down for a couple of weeks and then I tried doing like home deliveries and stuff. But then I was driving all over town um, doing like five or $10 drop offs. It just wasn't worth my time, um, but it kept me growing uh, at least a few trays a week just to kind of keep the rhythm going. And then uh, we're in Arizona, so a little bit more of a cowboy state here. So things opened up uh, fairly early <laughs> during the pandemic. And uh, May of that year, um, I got my first chef um, and I had offered them like promotional pricing, 50% like off like, just to get the account, just to get it. And I still work with that chef right now, which is great. Awesome. He's one of my favorite chefs. Um, so that was May 2020. And then I scaled to about 17 restaurants by October of that year. Um, so pretty quickly, I was doing like six or seven chef meetings a week. I was closing about 30 to 40 percent of those meetings, um, like in-person meetings uh, with, you know, enough nurture. And I grew pretty quickly, but I was still working full time, too. So yeah. I was fortunate to have uh, work for tens and I had Wednesdays off. So I would plant on Sunday, harvest, deliver, do sales, everything on Wednesdays and then work my full time job. So I reached this point where I couldn't do sales anymore because I was so busy doing the fulfillment and operations aspect. So um, I was just kind of in this like steady state. Um, and then unfortunately that December, uh, my mom ended up passing away uh, after two strokes. My son was born prematurely uh, nine weeks and spent a month in the NICU. And my wife almost bled out during all that. So it was like super crazy, lots of trauma. And we were just in survival mode. So um, I just kind of I fired some like annoying clients that were uh, they weren't open early enough for me to do deliveries and they didn't order a lot. And so we just kind of scaled the farm down. Um, we tried to sustain it for a while while working full time because obviously we needed like health insurance and stuff, stuff through a career. Um, but ultimately, I decided to close my farm. So I closed the farm for about a year. I sold off most of the equipment um, to a local farm. Um, and then actually in June of this year, uh, 2023, I quit my full-time pharmacy job. I have a part-time job that's like five hours a week. And then I'm, I'm, this is, this is my, my business and my family's, uh, you know, means of income moving forward. And, you know, we're going to make it work and you just do more of what works and keep pushing through the fundamentals. And, you know, I know I'll get there. Yeah, that that's, that's amazing. That what, what a, what a backstory. Um, first of all, sorry for, for your loss. That, that sounds like it was like a really tough time with so many different things going on. And then I can't imagine trying to run a microgreens business with all that going on. That's uh, 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 overwhelming amount to, 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 to manage and deal with and that sort of thing. Um, but the perseverance I think is, is really impressive that, you know, you found something that you loved and you had all these obstacles that made it maybe not viable in the short term, but then you were able to find a way to come back to it. And now you're going pretty much full time in on microgreens, which I think is, is, uh, it's just amazing. The spirit of farmers is just really incredible to see the, the perseverance. So thank, thanks for sharing that. Um, so it sounds like you're mostly selling to, to chefs from what I can tell, but it'd be kind of helpful to get a breakdown of, uh, if you do sell to any other clients and 
kind of why you chose to sell to those those customers. Right. So yeah, we're I would say ninety five percent chefs. We have one account that they're actually um, a compost company, so they pick up your compost at your house, and then they have a big field. They just compost it all. Um, and they used to actually take my microgreens waste away from me. Um, but then they started kind of acting as a CSA broker. So they're compiling a weekly farm box from all these different farms and they buy produce. So they actually buy 50 units or about $200 a week from me and they pick up from the farm. I don't have to go anywhere. So it's actually a great way. I think if you, if you want to sell to the public, but don't want to sell to the public, um, you can reach out to local farms in your area. Like if you go to the farmer's market and there's a bunch of farms and there's maybe one selling microgreens, if they don't want to grow it, you can reach out to them and offer them wholesale pricing, you know, a uh, five or $6 retail unit, you could sell them 350 or 375 um, and, you know, have a weekly consistent order there. So that's our one like off client, but like everyone else and the, the gist of our business is reaching out to restaurants and chefs. Um, just because we're in a major metropolitan area, uh, it's pretty easy. There's plenty. And to, you know, to build a million dollar farm, I don't need 2,000 clients. Um, you know, you can build it with a small market share. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, that, that's a really unique take on uh, sales. And I think it's a great idea because in a lot of places, uh, farms can't produce year round, right? So they need some sort of, like if they want to extend their CSA season, they don't want it to be just carrots and beets and cabbage, you know, they need some other sort of vegetables. So microgreens are a great way to add that in uh, to these CSA programs. So there might either be a seasonal or maybe a year round CSA in your area that uh, you can work with a farm and you're the microgreen supplier for that CSA. And if you do that five times, you can have just a business based on that alone. So I think that that's a yep. great, um, alternative to the traditional kind of sales methods. Um, and then, you know, farmers understand farmers better than I think anyone else. So I think those type of relationships are probably, uh, I would guess relatively easy to, to manage because they understand the production cycle of crops and issues that may pop up and, and would be, um, very easy to deal with, would be my guess overall, you know, obviously that's a, a general statement, but, um, I think that that's, uh, that's really great. And yeah, um, it's also great that you live in an area where COVID didn't have a major, major impact because um, a lot of places in the Northeast, including uh, in Toronto and Canada, uh, we had like, I think three or four lockdowns where restaurants closed and it was just oh. crazy from a business perspective. Like by the end, it was just like, oh yeah, there's another lockdown. I guess we're not selling your restaurants anymore. And it was just almost became the norm, which is crazy to say. Um, but it's great that where you are, you were able to kind of go steady state after that first initial lockdown and, and still have customers throughout that period. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, restaurants, I think, are great, too, just because it's kind of that right size where it's like a bigger order value per week than retail clients. But if you're in a small space like this 10 by 10 space I'm in for our farm right now, um, I could not take on a distributor in this space because it would be more than what I could provide. So uh, I think it's kind of that it's not too big, it's not too small, but it's enough. And, you know, I found that most chefs are ordering average order value, of, let's say $75 a week in product. You know, some I've had some that order $400 a, a week, so $1,600 a month. And I've had some that order like $10 a week. So, um, you know, we don't do order uh, mins to order or anything like that because we try and make it accessible. But if you have $75 as a weekly kind of target, then every chef you add to your weekly recurring orders is going to be about another three thousand dollars. So when I have in my CRM, I, I flag a value of three to four thousand dollars per like client that I'm meeting with because then it kind of it gives me a number of like what my revenue could be if I you know close all these clients and it's, it motivates me to, to keep going and get more. Yeah, no, that's that's really really smart. Yeah, I, I used to do that, but kind of in my head. Uh, or, or I would mark it down. Like I didn't have it well organized, but I would used to mark it down and be like, okay, I'm going to reach out to this customer, this type of distributor or this type of retail store generally sells this, this much product. And then once you meet with them, you kind of can get a better sense of how much it'll actually be. And then you can kind of categorize them. I think that's, that's, that's uh, a really smart thing to do. Uh, Cause then it can help you kind of gauge what customers to take on and then what that will equate to in in your business financially and or space wise is another big one right so do you find in your area that there is a lot of seasonality 
with restaurants? Like, do you find the summer a lot slower than because winter would, I'm guessing is the busier mm -hmm. season. Do you find a big difference between exactly. the two seasons? Yeah. So we have a very like mother's day is kind of like, if you don't plan your mother's day dinner reservation, like a month in advance, like it's impossible to get a brunch reservation. So that's kind of like the last push. And then things just like drop off for summer. Um, cause it just gets so hot here. It's like 110, 115, you know, Fahrenheit. It's, it's uncomfortable. So all of our visitors are gone and it's just everyone who lives here still. But, um, yeah. So, and, and then like 4th of July, even the locals are out traveling and stuff. So I have a lot of restaurants that'll skip their order that week. Um, and then like Labor Day, things start to cool off a little bit more and we get more visitors back in. And there's a big push to the holidays and then kind of a little slow season right now for like a week or two. And then now we're entering where we get like um, snowbirds coming for spring training, um, you know, visiting from Canada for the winter. And so we have a lot more influx of people. The restaurants are bit busier. There's patio weather. Uh, it was, you know, it's gorgeous until about March or April. And then, um, you know, then we kind of start to paper after Mother's Day there. So we have, after doing this for a couple of years, um, you definitely start to see your unique seasonality uh, just based off of, you know, order changes and, and things you get from chefs as time goes on. For sure. Yeah, I think for, for, for a farmer or a business owner to get a sense of their business, I feel like you need a full year to, to get a sense. Because, like, if, for example, let's say you start, like, selling in, let's say, like, March or something, which is maybe close to peak uh, season in your local area. And then you expect, oh, that's just going to be the same every week. But then summer comes along and it's a very different story. So I think you really need a full year of running a microgreens business to get a sense of what the demand is in your local area. And it, and it changes a lot because I've talked to people in like Utah where they have like a double season or, or, or in BC and Canada mm -hmm. where you have like the the summer uh, tourist season and then you have like the skiing season. So same thing in Utah. So depending on where you are, you might have double peak seasons, you might have one peak season, or you may have more consistent production, like somewhere like Florida, where there's kind of tourism all year round. So it really depends on your local area, what you'll really see in from a demand perspective. But I think that's really important to figure that out uh, for production and then to figure out the numbers and um, what your business is going to be like. Um, I generally find sh like restaurants have more seasonality than retail, but there still can be seasonality in um, retail customers. Because for example, if people are on vacation in the summer, they're less likely to buy product than if they are home because their kids are in school sort of thing. There, there's going to be more demand those type of times a year from a retail perspective. So it's a bit different, but it's just important to understand that for your business. And my goal this, this next year, the first half of the year is to start getting into grocery so that I can, as we approach that, you know, slow season in the summer, I can start adding grocery accounts during that time. And then they tend to be a little more stable year round as far as reorder. So uh, that's one thing we'll be adding this year. For sure. Cool. Um, so I'd love to hear kind of what the most popular varieties are for your restaurant clients um, that you grow or mixes that you grow. Yeah. So chefs, I, I found they want color and they want flavor. Um, and But it doesn't have to be fancy. You don't have to grow all these crazy things. I don't do lots of herbs. I don't do, you know, basil, like all these super long things. Um, they just want color and flavor. And you can find a lot of that in 10 day crops. So um, I actually went through my invoicing software and like ran the data to find because I thought I knew what was like the most popular uh, or most revenue generating. Um, but to be honest, speckled peas are the cheapest thing I sell. And they were the highest like uh, revenue generating just because I think everybody orders a little bit of it uh, for the most part for me. And then um, second was radish trio was what I call it. But it's the colorful radish mix from like True Leaf Market. So uh, ruby, stem, a daikon, and like the rambo radish um, all mixed together. Um, but you can buy it pre-mixed and just grow it in one tray so you don't have to mix it after harvest. And then um, cilantro is pretty popular, um, but again, it's not a huge amount. But I would say the most popular one I have now is in September, I added uh, what I call a bright lights mix. And it's um, the rambo radish, uh, red acre cabbage, red mizuna, beets and amaranth so it's just all the most colorful stuff and every week i get chefs increasing the order you know that they want that they're using right now part of that's the seasonality but it's also um, it was almost seven percent of our revenue last year and i only did it for the last three months of the year so oh, wow. it's becoming 
a leader for me. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and you don't grow them all in the same tray, right? You grow them separately? No, I, I, I have thought about growing everything except for like the beets and amaranth in one tray so that it's less mixing. But I find that I'm already harvesting each crop individually for other orders that it just makes sense to grow them separately. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. I thought for a second you said you were saying you grow them together. And I was like, wow, I need to hear more about no, that. No, I've no. never heard of that. Yeah. So are you growing like some of those crops you mentioned, like beets and cilantro and amaranth are generally more than a 10 day crop. Are you growing them as a 10 day crop or are you growing them as like so, a longer crop? Uh, I'm still struggling with beets. So they are the tiniest amounts in there. Um, I grow them on 10 days, but they the terrible yields right now. I've seen people post on YouTube about 10 ounce harvests on beets and I, I'm not there yet. Um, I have a lot of dampening off issues with beets. I just bought myself some fine vermiculite. So I'm going to give that a try to see if that helps. And then oh, I nice. will probably grow the beets for longer to get more yield once I kind of dial that in. But I just reduce, it's just a sprinkling of, you know, bright red color. Um, the amaranth, however, though, um, we do in 10 days. So oh, wow. um, it's very, it's very petite and it's almost like kind yeah. of like hair like, but um, you get about, I get about two, two and a half ounces per tray. Um, when I sell it by itself, I do um, a 24 ounce volume container and I do it just by volume. It's not, you know, four ounces of product. It's just, uh, I, got it. I, I aim to put about two in there. I grow amaranth for 15 days, pretty large size leaf um, yield, still not great. But because you're adding the color, it's, it's, you know, you kind of need it to make a mix as beautiful as it can be. But the challenge with it is it's more prone to dampening off. So by growing it for a shorter period of time, you most likely would have less dampening off issues. Now the, the trade-off is the yield's going to be lower uh, by doing it that way. But still like they're, you know, if you're having a lot of dampening off issues then maybe growing something like amaranth for a shorter period of time might be a better option to prevent that because it seems to be pretty common. And I was just going to mention with, with beets, um, a great thing uh, that I've heard, I, I don't have a lot of experience with beets, is using soil on top, like not just vermiculite. Um, there might be something with the bacteria or, or microbiome in the peat moss that will help the germination. But again, this is hearsay, not my personal experience with it. Because yeah, beets- That's what I, I'm doing already. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. So then it's more so the- yeah, so I hope the vermiculite works. Keep, definitely keep me up to date on that because I definitely been recommending vermiculite for everything across the board because that's what I've used. But um, I don't know how much that'll help with the germination for beets. It'll definitely help than not having anything. But compared to soil, it's kind of hard to 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 know without having the experience myself. Um, yeah, so it'd be great to kind of hear what an average week as the owner of Ransom Farms would be like for you. Yeah. So, um, before I get into the timeline, like I always, I struggle with the busier you get with the farm, the more you get tied up in the maintenance tasks of doing the farm. And that's kind of what I'll run through. Um, but I always try and make a point to like have an objective for the week of like, what's one problem I can solve? What's, you know, what sales outreach can I do? Like what I, I try and target a growth activity that I can do for the week, whether that's leveraging my time or getting more business and trying to prioritize that amongst, amongst all of the, you know, the day-to-day -day stuff that we have to do. So as far as our production goes, um, I plant on Sundays right now. And again, we do everything on pretty much a 10 day cycle. We do cilantro on seven, 17 days, but um, it's seven day stack. So it's really only 10 days under lights. Um, and that's our longest crop right now. Um, so everything follows a weekly flow. And I, you know, I think the great thing about microgreens is that you have these grow timelines that are ranges and you can be flexible to make it standardized. Like you don't have to plant five days a week to get a harvest. You know, you can decide good enough is good enough and, you know, um, make it work. So it's not crazy all the time. Um, so anyway, we plant on Sundays. Um, and then on Mondays I have a virtual assistant. And she actually goes into our invoice software and creates like a packet for me to print all of our invoices. Um, we also use a report in the invoice software to generate a list of every single item that is to be harvested. And then what she does is she does some manipulation that's super tedious. I used to do it myself and she would um, generate like a merge 
printing. So I don't know if you've like ever sent out Christmas letters with Word. You can import an Excel sheet of like all your friends and their addresses, and then it creates labels for each person. I'm essentially using that functionality to uh, have this report where it says, you know, brassica blend, four ounces, and then there's 10 of them. And then, you know, red radish, um, eight ounces, there's three of them or whatever. And then it's just this big Excel sheet. We plug it into the Word document, and then I have a custom list of labels of everything exactly what I need to harvest. So essentially, my labeled containers are my pick pack list in that sense. Oh, interesting. Okay. It's kind of technical. It's not super yeah. easy, um, but it it's saved a lot of time because I'm not like on a checklist while I'm harvesting, and I just know when I'm done all the containers, they're they're done and I have everything. So mm -hmm. it's tedious. It doesn't take a lot of time, but she does that work for me. Um, and then she also tracks some KPIs that we track every week to kind of monitor our business. Um, on Tuesdays, I label containers and then I usually start harvesting um, in the afternoon or evening. I don't harvest everything on Tuesdays. Um, usually Wednesday is kind of like our target, but I like to get a jump start as I'm getting dizzier. Um, Wednesday, we finish harvest and then I also then unstack and water everything that was waiting in germination. So as soon as things come off, new things go in. Uh, and then Wednesday afternoon, I do about 10 chef deliveries. They're closer to the farm and they're kind of uh, more uh, clustered than some of my other deliveries are. Um, Thursday morning, I usually dump and wash trays and then I deliver some of those far reaching accounts that are further away. And then Friday, I usually just do manage any order changes after talking to chefs during delivery. Um, and then I do prep for planting on Sunday. So that's filling trays and prepping seed. And we prep all of our seed, all of our non-soaked seed in uh, four ounce souffle cups. So we can just have them all pre-measured. Um, they don't take up a lot of space. And then you can just plant real quick. Uh, that being said, I'm very excited to get my hands on one of uh, your uh, new devices that's hopefully coming out soon. Yeah, me and James uh, from Virgo are working uh, very hard to get that done as soon as possible because we we like I've literally had farms reach out and be like, S please send this to me as soon as I can because like when you scale up, you know, like if you're seeding like a thousand trays or, or you know whatever, it, it can be very time consuming. So we just want to make something that is really really good. So it's really good right now, but we want to make sure that when we send it to farms, that it's going to be. Like they're not going to run into issues and things like that. So we're just kind of working out like any sort of kinks that pop up. We have a few test farms that are starting to, to use it now that are close to us. So we'll get some feedback, make any improvements needed. And then we should hopefully, fingers crossed, should hopefully be have it for sale um, sometime either next month or in March at the latest would be my guess at this point. Um, but yeah, it's it's a very time consuming part of of the process. And it's nice because you don't, you don't have to measure out seed anymore. We're going to make like a chart right. where it says, okay, you want five grams of this or 20 grams of this seed. Then you just use this wheel with this roller and you get that result, which is really nice uh, to <laughs> make uh, farmers' lives a lot easier. Uh, Things like that are important to me because like I, I tie myself and to pre-measure seed, it took me 30 to 45 minutes a week. It's not a lot of time right now. That's doing about 100 trays a week uh, almost. And um, But to not have to do that and remove that, you gain that time back like infinitely. So, you know, yeah. when you can gain efficiencies and reduce waste or reduce motion, which is waste, um, you know, it just makes things so much easier and quicker. And you can just get more and more leverage for yourself and your farm. For sure. Yeah, that, that's why I love tools like the the Quick Cut Greens Harvester. Like, I have no affiliation with them. I just promote their harvester because it's by far the best option for for farms, big or small, and uh, and it's cost effective. So we just wanted to create tools like that for people uh, to make their lives easier. Because I know how 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 hard it is uh, doing everything manually in the in the first stage of of Living Earth Farm. So. Um, yeah, just I'm very, very excited to have that and other tools that we're, we're planning on creating coming out in the in the next year uh, and beyond. Um, but in terms of uh, production, it sounds like Saturday is really your off, your off day right now. Do you find that you still have to water seven days a week or have you found a way to kind of reduce the watering uh, to less than once a day? Yeah, so actually um, right now I'm using a 
ore-based uh, soil medium that I get from our local worm farm. And again, oh, yeah. they have big windrows of composts and they do worm castings and black uh, soldier fly larvae and all they do you know, tea and all that stuff. Um, but the guy who runs that operation used to work for a farm that did like huge micrograins production. So he's kind of created this custom uh, soil mix. And being that it's core based, um, I find that I have to water once a week. To, like for, for the 10 day crops, they get watered in germination. Um, they get watered like two days after unstacking and they're still wet <laughs> at harvest. Like it holds so much water right now. Um, that being said, I'm actually, uh, it's, it's a lot heavier to work with to fill trays and like you get the big clumps of mats. Like it's not super, fil uh, it's not super um, like fine. So sometimes it's hard to, to get the trays level and stuff. Uh, and then long term, I actually plan to buy, there's a soil uh, tray filling machine by Still Pro. Um, that I'm sure if you're doing microgreens, you're getting ads for all the time. Um, but anyway, it's a front, you know, it fits a bale of soil. You could add Gaia Green and it'll mix it all for you. Um, I just found that ProMix is a lot lighter to work with, and uh, I'm, I'm likely switching back to that um, just because I don't have to go pick it up myself. And then also, oh. um, it's just, I think it's it's lighter weight to work with, um, but it does require more watering. So that in that case, I water about every other day um, when things are under lights. For the, yeah, the life yeah. of like three to four times a week is probably the most. And I used to do every day, um, but then I, I don't think you need it. But it also depends on your humidity too. Like I'm in this tiny room, like once I went past 20 trays, like the humidity skyrocketed. So you have a hundred trays plus another hundred in germination, like uh, over there, all in, all in a 10 by 10 space, like the humidity gets so high. So even with a dehumidifier, like, um, you know, I think the soil kind of retains some of the moisture just because of the environment that we're growing in. Yeah, for sure. Coconut coir holds a lot of water. Sometimes I'm kind of shocked that people are watering every day and people are often shocked back in like in consulting when I tell them like, hey, you don't, you shouldn't have to water every day. And some people are watering twice a day. Some people are watering once a day. Um, but most people water every day. And, and it's really something that you can reduce significantly and then one that saves time but it also um allows you to create like a like a, a, a schedule so because like at the beginning the crops are small you may need to water every three days and then every two days or every you know maybe the last day you water two days in a row or something like that but to just have those schedules even if you're doing it manually just makes it uh a, a lot easier because like to spend all that extra time watering um like really small amounts of water, I haven't seen any benefit from like a yield perspective or anything from that. Obviously, if you water too much, if you overwater at the beginning, um, then it can reduce this, for specific varieties that are more sensitive, can reduce yields and stuff like that and cause more disease. But if, if you're watering once, like if you're watering every day, you're probably just watering, in my opinion, watering not enough. Um, and you could just add more volume of water on that watering and reduce the number of waterings you do would be uh, an easy way just to cut out labor. And then also it's great because then the reason I asked this question was um, because a lot of people don't get weekends off um, or, or at least a, a day off, right? So if you can um, not have to water every day, then there's certain days. And even if, even if it, the farm's in your home or it's a five minute drive, it's still like, there's like a, a benefit to just having a day where you don't need to think about the farm. You don't need to, go there uh, as much as like, I think most microgreen farms love what they're doing. It's really good to have like some sort of separation with that. So to have some sort of day that you can get off, uh, especially as you get more years of growing microgreens, I think is really, really beneficial. Yeah. Well, and here's the thing, like I, I'm a big advocate of uh, Ben Hartman's book, uh, The Lean Farm. I don't know if you've read it. I do not recommend his microgreens advice, but he approaches farming from a lean manufacturing perspective and you know that's yeah. what microgreens growing is it's essentially manufacturing you have an end product then you have a sub assembly to get there and then you've got your raw ingredients on a in manufacturing or on a farm and those are things that add value or there's um waste that is has to be done and there's waste that is just waste so i think watering has to be done but it doesn't actually add value essentially to the final product it's just the minimum requirements to keep it alive right so i think 
approaching tools and automation to do the things that are required that don't add value with less time and less resources is always a win. So I think watering systems are definitely very much in that regard. Like you can reduce wasting your time watering just to keep things alive. So um, I am interested in approaching uh, like an, possibly like an ebb and flow with a, a reservoir uh, to be able to add nutrient solutions and stuff as we get more space. Um, especially as we add edible flowers, there's a nutrient solution I'll need to use for that. So, um, but yeah, I think when you, when you're, I'm always thinking about these things when I'm doing the, the grind of the farm is like, how can I eliminate this? How can I do it quicker? And, you know, how can I make it, make things easier for myself? And yeah, you know, I think it just also long term for me, this is a, a million dollar revenue farm. We're not there close yet. I can't get there by myself. Like there's not enough hours in a week for me to get there on my own. So thinking of these efficiencies and tools to make the work easier for myself as I build a team is ultimately going to make their job easier and more enjoyable with more dignity. Um, so I think you can't go wrong when you're looking for efficiencies and cutting waste. Yeah, a hundred percent. I totally agree. I think that's the right mindset to have to scale a microgreens business. Uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm glad you have that mindset because I think it's so so important um, in in scaling. Um, but getting into your plans for the future, I'd love to hear kind of what you're planning uh, in the near future and in the next one to five years in either production space or customer base. What kind of your plans are for for your farm? Yeah, so uh, as I mentioned, we're in a 10 by 10, it's like a spare bedroom slash um, office in our home. And there I have four uh, grow racks, uh, pretty much they touch, you know, they surround the walls here. And then I have one germination rack in here. Um, each of my racks are uh, six levels. So I've kind of Frankenstein several, nice. uh, you know, cart boxes to make my own ones. And they're spaced about nine to 10 inches each so I can grow 24 trays per rack. So there's essentially 100 trays under lights. We are extremely at capacity. Um, I think with what I planted last week, uh, I don't have enough lights for what I'm about to ungerminate or unstack tomorrow. So we actually, um, what's interesting is when I closed my farm and sold off all the equipment, I sold it to a market farm uh, down the street, 10 minutes from my house. Um, and, you know, they have a Saturday market on property and they, grow the traditional market farm. They bought like all my equipment. Um, about two months ago, I reached out to her and had coffee with her. And she's like, you know what? We have this house on the property and there's a residential tenant in there. She's like, her lease is up mid-March. Uh, do you want that space? And it's on a county island. So I don't have to worry about HOAs and all that stuff. And um, so essentially mid-March, we're moving into a 2000 square foot home that will just be the farm. Uh, wow. I'm not going to live there. It's just through the operation. Um, the benefit is that literally the Saturday market is right out the door of the house. Um, there's a whole, they have their own giant compost thing, so I can dump all my waste there without worrying about it. Um, so it's just a lot of opportunity. And uh, fingers crossed that that tenant decides to move out early. But um, if not, we're just kind of hanging on till, till then. So yeah, I would imagine. Awesome. So convenient. Yeah. Well, it's just nice to have that stacked, uh, kind of stacked production too. So my primary business is that, you know, the CSA broker and then restaurants like that's, and then possibly grocery. But for the most part, let's say restaurants, I tend to have some extras or somebody cancels an order and maybe there's an extra tray of peas. I either eat it or it goes to waste. But in this instance, I can package it as three ounce units and sell it on Saturday because I'm harvesting, you know, Wednesday or Thursday. So mm. there's an opportunity to kind of sell off some of that excess or even just like sell there intentionally and kind of increase revenue that way. Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's great. This is the first time I've, I've heard of using a residential home for that, but it really doesn't matter. The only thing would be is if you want to put racking in, then a warehouse would be more suitable. But if you're using the baker's racks, then I, like, you know, you can kind of even, what's kind of cool is you can separate it by temperature uh, and humidity levels in different rooms and have like a basil room that's a lot warmer if you have enough demand for basil and things like that. So mm -hmm. it's kind of, there are some unique benefits 
to that, which is which is really really cool. The other thing that um, you know, I think long term to get to my vision of you know million dollar revenue a year, it will end up in a warehouse or we will buy a property where we can build a building to house that. Um, but I think this property definitely has the potential, you know, three to 400,000 a year, just in this home, just doing microgreens and edible flowers. Um, you know, the property is like five or six acres. So there's option to put a storage, uh, shipping container and maybe do mushrooms. Like there's ways to stack products. Um, there's also the opportunity that I could, that they don't do any wholesale commercial sales. So I have an opportunity to sell them sell their stuff to my chefs at, you know, ah. either take a cut of it or buy it wholesale and resell it myself. There's opportunities to collaborate there um, just by being on property and, you know, sharing. sharing yeah, that's space. great. Yeah. Collaboration is so, so valuable. And uh, uh, yeah. yeah, sometimes it can be tough, but uh, at the end of the day, like if you can find the right people to collaborate with, I think uh, there's just mutual beneficiality that flows in, in all directions. So, that, that's that's amazing. Um, now, moving on to more kind of uh, on the personal side of things, what would you say your favorite microgreen uh, to consume at home is? So I, I I don't eat enough of them to be honest, but uh, I've got a whole tray of leeks or you know row of leeks here. Leeks are probably my favorite. It's just a simple onion to add to scrambled eggs or avocado toast or stuff like that. Um, otherwise just broccoli and smoothies. And then I would say the best for toddlers cause I have a three-year-old and a four-year-old, um, some flowers, but I, I never grow them just because, uh, I don't really sell them for restaurants and I got tired of dealing with the seed holes and stuff. Yeah. But they would eat, they would eat a tray a week each probably. I, I used to love a micro garlic chives and leeks and onions and they're so delicious i haven't actually grown them in years but i think just having this conversation is going to be something that i'm definitely going to going to grow again i think you just inspired me to 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 grow leeks because there's not that many farms that actually uh grow leeks or, or onions anymore that at least i've seen yeah yeah i like it and you'll see these ones that are right here these are i grow them 10 days um this one right here has been grown a week over because it was extra um, I get a lot more yield when I grow them longer, but sometimes I yeah. just have to turn them to get them out. Um, one one thing I'll, I'll give a nod to my friends at Legacy Greens in Tallahassee. Um, they they become like friendships to me, where we I paid them awesome. for some flower consulting, and then uh, they they had questions about my VA and uh, some software I was using. But they turned me on to yellow leaks. So essentially, you grow the leaks in blackout the whole time, uh, and they tend to be a bit sweeter and a little more mild. Um, but again, chefs are always looking for color, so it's an easy way to grow more in this space without having to use lights um, by pushing more things to, to blackout grow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was just thinking from a flavor perspective, they're probably really good, uh, but the yield's pretty low. But from your perspective, yeah. you're out of space right now. So having something that doesn't need lights is like until March when you move into the new uh, space, uh, it is huge to have something that you can grow that doesn't necessarily need light because you're like you're limited right now and until March. Yeah, definitely. And yeah, I think again, another thing to think about for small spaces is like, to be honest, your in-home electrical is probably one of your biggest bottlenecks <laughs> as far yeah. as like, uh, I used to use Sun Blaster. Uh, they were like half an amp per light. Um, I could only do two shelves in here with that amperage because it would start tripping over 12 amps. Uh, I start switch to the Barina ones that are only like 26 uh, watts or whatever. So they're about a quarter amp per light. So I can do twice the production in here. Granted, they're not the best lights because they don't put out quite as much power, but my yields are still just fine. Six to eight ounces on most things. So uh, it, you know, makes up for the, the loss in not having high quality lights. Yeah, it, it's a good point you brought up because uh, even when I was growing in, my parents' house, when I switched to the basement, I had to actually upgrade and add, I think, two or three dedicated uh, outlets on, on their own circuits or their own breakers so that I can actually have the, the production that that space can, can, can manage. But you're right in that that often is in a home setup. The limiting factor is um, how, many, how many circuits you have in that grow space. Um, it's not overly, like it would pay for itself pretty fast to add it in, but it depends on 
how old your home is, where it's located, what, you know, what the, pretty much what the panel is and what power draws you have. Um, as an example, if you have like electric heating and you live somewhere north, you're going to obviously use a lot more electricity. So you're, you're more limited than if you're heating with gas or, or, or oil or something like that. Um, and vice versa with air conditioning. If you, if you like live somewhere really warm that you need the air conditioning running all the time, you're going to have less power available. Uh, but most new, like most homes built in the last like 20, 30 years usually have a decent amount of extra power available. So it really just depends on where you want to scale the business. If you want to scale in your home. And then of course, if you have the power, but usually you can always upgrade it. It just sometimes depending on if the panel needs to be upgraded as well, it can start getting a bit pricey. So, uh, moving on, uh, to the challenges, uh, in running a micro microgreens business, microgreens business, which can be, uh, quite numerous. Uh, if you had the ability to just wave a magic wand and instantly solve one of the business challenges you have, what would that issue be that you wanted to resolve and why? Uh, I don't, it, it would require a magic wand because time, time is the issue. Like, even though I said, I only am working like 20 hours a week to do the production, uh, what ends up happening is delivering to restaurants. Um, there's usually a somewhat narrow window that you can deliver in, um, depending on when they open, uh, versus when service starts and they don't want you there. So to do all my deliveries in a narrow time frame, um, I'm starting to get at capacity. So one way I could manage that is harvest Wednesday and then deliver Wednesday, Thursday. I could add a second production uh, cycle that's staggered to that so that I could harvest Monday and then deliver Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. So I'm trying to leverage my personal time as much as I can while I'm building the business. But again, ultimately, I know I'll need a team. So magic wand would be to have somebody do deliveries because that is about 50% of my hours in a week is doing the deliveries right now. Wow. Um, but again, we're in a very broad metropolitan area. I was not selective in choosing restaurants. I'm just trying to grow as quickly as possible. So I'm, you know, taking it. I have about half the valley I don't do, the West Valley, but the East and the North is all part of where we deliver. So on uh, Thursdays, like my first deliveries, um, you know, like 35 minutes away, but then I end up delivering $500 worth of products, you know, on my way back. Yeah. So it, it's not, I think if, I think when this comes up a lot, when people are like, well, there's a town neighboring me that's an hour away. It's like, well, that makes sense. If you can sweep all the restaurants in that area and get, you know, 10 restaurants on your delivery. So, yeah, yeah. That's just, that's, that's kind of uh, the approach I took. To that problem, which was how do you make more time from the most limited resource in the world, which is your time, is um, it, I think it's just it just comes down to like one, which I think you're already doing, uh, which is using tools that will help you know minimize the amount of production work. But deliveries is one where you know until until uh, autonomous cars come out or self driving cars, I think that one's a little tougher to solve. Like obviously you can. Uh, leverage your time by utilizing other people's time by hiring someone, but you obviously have to account for how that, how does that work for your business and financial plans you have in expansion and all those type of things. So uh, I think get, like just from that, I think utilizing tools and then leveraging your time with others, which in a way you're already doing with the VA, right? Uh, but it, deliveries sound like it's the biggest bottleneck in your time right now. So finding someone that can do that, or even just a third party might, there might be third parties that are reasonably priced to do that. But I think it would be less expensive to just hire someone uh, to do that, especially as you scale, it could be more, more and more of a uh, income for that person. Uh, but yeah, that that's, uh, it's definitely a tough problem to solve is, uh, is creating more time. Uh, and really the only way is like, like, you know, is leveraging your time with, with others and technology and that sort of thing. Yeah. And, you know, that's one thing I'm hoping to get access to as we move into the new property, too. They have uh, volunteers and they have uh, interns from the School of Sustainability at ASU. So I'm kind of hoping to tap into that labor resource to, uh, again, they, I wouldn't have them do deliveries and stuff, but they could fill trays, clean trays, uh, prep seed, um, water, like, you know, those are things that they can do and or even assist with harvest because then I can, you know, share information with them and they can learn something as well. But um, I'm hoping to kind of tap into that labor pool and then I would actually probably outsource most of the operations and then keep deliveries to myself because then I get face-to-face -face interaction with chefs. I can directly manage order changes and stuff like that. So um, 
while I would personally like to, to hand that off the most, I think uh, sales wise, it makes the most sense for me to offload the busy work and be out, be out meeting with chefs and working with our existing chefs. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, sometimes I forget about that aspect of, of, of delivering. And I feel like I've heard this a few times now where uh, if you have close relationships with chefs, one easy way to kind of keep that is like, you're the you're the person who's delivering. So you can just check in with them, you know, easily. There are other ways I think to, to, to do that. But like, if you have to go drive around to all these places, you know, every, every two weeks to check in with your, your customers, you might as well just do the deliveries at that point. But if it's like checking in, you can call them and, and that sort of thing, which I think eventually would probably be the route to go. Um, cause if let's say you have a hundred chefs, it'd be hard to like, you know, deliver to a hundred restaurants on your own and then actually talk and meet with them during that time period. Uh, so there's, there's a, a point where it would be more difficult, but, um, you know, when you got 20, 30, I think it's, it's pretty manageable to, to kind of do the delivery, manage the relationship in, at the same time and kind of kill two birds with one stone there. Yeah. I would, I would guess I'm probably going to max out at about 50 clients to be able to personally deliver all of those. Um, just even if I spread it out over four days, just cause 10 to 15 is probably the max I can do in like a three to four hour window. Um, so yeah, but you also mentioned a, you know, third party doing delivery that that company that does the compost pickup and my CSA stuff, like they deliver those farm boxes and they have cooler trucks. So it's like, you gave me the idea. I might have to reach out to them and see how much they would charge to deliver all my stuff every week. They're already coming on Wednesdays to pick up their stuff so they could just take it all. So yeah. I'll let you know if that works out. Yeah, no, it, 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 again, another, another potential collaboration I think could be, could be beneficial for you to gain back some of that time that you can spend on, uh, on other things as well. You know, cause if you think about how long you're actually spending talking to the chefs versus driving, that's where like that, that's in my head where I'm like, okay, the, there, there's a bit of an imbalance in, in that portion of it. At least that's my guess. Obviously I'm not there. Uh, mm -hmm. and I haven't worked directly with chefs a ton to, to, to see how long you're actually spending, uh, in, in that environment. And obviously everyone's gonna be different, right? Some people can, you can talk to one person for 30 minutes, um, and just, just kind of, um, talk shop sort of thing. And then someone else could be two minutes. So there's a lot of variability there. Um, but I'm guessing I know the answer to this next question. Um, but what, what was, what's the biggest hurdle you find in acquiring new customers? Now, obviously right now you're not looking for new customers, but if let's say March comes and you're like, I need to get new customers. What do you think is that biggest hurdle to actually get new customers, um, for your business? So I, I feel pretty comfortable and strategic at this point after doing restaurant sales for a while. Um, I think one thing that if you're thinking about starting microgreens, um, especially selling to restaurants, is um, this quote from Alex Hormozzi, where he says, your market is more important than your offer, which is more important than your sales skills. So, like, I was super nervous to do sales in the beginning because I was like, an introvert. I was, like, shaking the first time I went to talk to a chef. I was, you know, because you hear about big egos and stuff like that. Um, but I think if you think of that kind of hierarchy, like, I'm in Phoenix. There's thousands of restaurants. It's an amazing market to sell to restaurants. But if you're in rural North Dakota, where I grew up, there's three restaurants and they serve patty melts and uh, chicken strips, you know. <laughs> so there's probably not a lot of opportunity there. So if you're in a great market, then you consider your offer, which uh, for me is the weekly recurring order. Our stuff lasts 10 to 14 days in the cooler. The stuff you're getting from a distributor probably lasts two to three days. Um, we don't have order minimums. We don't do delivery fees. Uh, again, we're just trying to remove as much friction for them as possible. And again, I sell that offer of the recurring order in the sense that having our standing order allows me to plan production, which allows me to reduce waste, which allows me to um, keep our prices super competitive while offering a superior product than they would get from a distributor. So when you frame it that way, that's like the offer, um, which anyone can use to sell to restaurants. And, you know, it's a, it's pretty much a slam dunk if they're ordering from a distributor and you grow essentially what they would be using. Um, and then the last part of that equation is your sales skills. So if you're in a great market, you got that good offer, you can be terrible at sales. You just talk to enough people and you'll get there.
So I think the instance where if you have less of a market, you don't have a strong offer, um, then you need to be like really salesy to make it happen. But one other thing I want to mention about sales, especially for uh, people who are interested in selling the chefs, is that it's it's cold outreach. It's all cold outreach. Like you're not going to post on social media and have chefs knocking on your door. Um, it's cold outreach. You need to initiate um, reaching out to restaurants. And there's ways you can do that. We do it through Instagram by presetting meetings. Um, I do have two meetings this week, even though I have no space. Um, and then you can cold call. You can drop in. Um, I, some people do the Boston method uh, that I got from Oliver. You kick open the back door and say, who's in charge? And then you, <laughs> you try and sell them. Um, there's lots of different ways. But the, the, and you should do it all. You should do multiple options because, um, you know, most people, when they're doing sales, don't follow up or reach out enough. Uh, they ask once and then give up. Um, I think there are statistics that, like, between 8 to 12 touches is what it takes to sell something. So I do that split. So I assume 8 to 12 touches to get the meeting with the chef. And then at least eight to 12 touches to nurture them after the meeting. And I think what's easy about having a weekly planting schedule is that uh, you have a weekly cohort, as Alex Formosi calls it, where, um, you know, the next one's starting soon. Do you want to get in? So like every week you just follow up with the chef, say, hey, uh, do you have any questions? Do you want to try anything else? Um, or is there anything we can get started for you on planting on Sunday? And that's what I'm going to be doing today and tomorrow is following up with old clients, uh, people I've met with recently. And then you do that enough times. Um, you're not bothering anybody. Um, you're trying to help them and solve the, a problem with your product. And, you know, you feel less annoying after you get used to doing it a lot. But you got to follow up more. And uh, I highly, highly recommend people read uh, the newest book from Alex Formozzi, which is the $100 million leads. Uh, it is the clearest framework of marketing and like outreach and getting engaged uh, leads for your business that I've seen. Um, I think a lot of people wonder if they should be doing more social media and all this stuff. But essentially, he says that the four ways that you can sell things personally is to do warm outreach. So messaging your friends, hey, do you want to buy my microgreens? Um, you can do paid ads and, you know, uh, I think you guys teach that in the Freedom Farmers course. Um, you can post free content and hope people order, and you can do cold outreach. So I, I guess one other thing I'd say about cold outreach, too, is that it, you, you develop a formula after a while. So if I message 20 restaurants to meet with their chef, I'll probably get five to six responses on Instagram, probably meet with four to six of those, and then I probably close about a third of those. So then what happens is you start to realize these numbers and that can depend on the seasonality and the types of people you're reaching out to, but you kind of, you kind of figure out this base formula and then you just feed the formula, reach out to a hundred restaurants, reach out to, you know, 200, follow up with those ones again. And you just feed that machine and you get the output and you'll grow. That was phenomenal. That was, that was just absolutely a gem of advice. Um, I, I a hundred percent agree with all that. I think first of all, Alex Ramosi is, is a is a great resource for anyone that hasn't um read his books or, or seen his content. Um there, there's a lot there. He's like really gone full in on, on uh on promoting his, his work. So um just maybe honestly, if you just go on YouTube, find his most popular search by popular videos, just watch a few of them. You can kind of get a sense. But I I hundred percent agree. It's it's I I've, I've learned a lot from from Alex as well on, on, on sales. And, um, and it's just been very, very game changing for me understanding the marketing side of, of business. Uh, and then also, I think it's helpful that the, the frame you used of like, people often expect, okay, I'm going to reach out to a chef if they don't hear back from me, oh, I didn't do a good job or something, but it really, there's like part of it that's skill, but part of it's also a numbers game where like, you know, you can reach out to a chef and it could be the wrong time. And then you can reach out to the same chef at the right time and get a customer. So uh, I, I think, you know, repeating that process and sometimes going back, like I've gotten maybe 15, 20% of the customers at Living Earth by going back to a customer that initially said no, showed a little bit of interest. 
and it was just the wrong timing. So I think it's, it's, it's really important to uh, not get discouraged when a sale doesn't go through when you wanted it to, uh, but use it as like, you know, a learning opportunity to improve your skill set um, and to just reach out to more people or set a schedule for yourself to reach out to a certain number of people. I think he kind of says like, you know, just set a goal to reach out to a hundred people per day or per week. Um, that may like, let's say you're doing direct to consumer that may be interested in your product and, um, and just like improve your sales pitch over time with that. And it'll get better and better on the sales perspective. Um, but I think a, another really important point you mentioned, which is the market comes first. So if there is like, if you're in North Dakota and, um, you're trying to sell to restaurants, maybe that's not the best approach because there's not really much of a market there. There would be more of a market for direct to consumer, but you have to have people mm -hmm. For, to sell your product. And if you're in a place where there's really no people, then you need to go where there are people. So if you're in a town of, let's say a hundred, and there's a town near you that has 5,000 people, that's a 20 minute drive away. I would probably spend my time on that town that has 5,000 people instead of your local town only yeah. has a hundred. So we talked earlier about um, your business, kind of you wanting it to, your, your, your goal was to have it be a million dollar revenue business. So what do you see, um, as obstacles to to get to that vision of having a million dollar revenue, larger scale my greens farm. Well, so let me back up a little bit because uh, first of all, the whole million dollar revenue thing is a new mental model for me, and um, I think seeing I, I don't know what your revenue was or what you sold your business for your farm for, but seeing that you created a, a saleable asset from your farm. Uh, and grew that organically. Um, and then I think I saw that Dave from Micro Acres has possibly hit a, th a million dollars in revenue last year. Like we're now beyond the, the possibility of making 10 to $20,000 a month to making possibly $80,000 a month. And I think having at least two uh, accounts that I can see that happening, like that gives me a mental model to know that I can do it. And I can probably do it faster. It's like you're standing on the shoulders of giants, right? Like um, you know, it was at the four minute mile, nobody, they thought it was impossible. And then as soon as somebody did it, like 10 other people did it. So I think we're in this, like, that's, what's most exciting now is like large scale controlled agricultural, uh, controlled environment, agricultural works. But as you've mentioned previously with like venture capitalists and like going all in and just growing, 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 um, through a big financial push like that isn't working. But now as more of a smaller growers build up over time, uh, more people have this opportunity to, to create these, you know, uh, big investment assets that can be a retirement for themselves. Or, you know, you can keep a business that kicks out a million dollars a year or you can sell it for three to five million. Um, and that can be, you know, more than just creating a job for yourself. For sure. So, yeah, I think I think the, the, <laughs> the asset of. Of, 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 of a business, you're not just creating an income for yourself. It's like the next step beyond that. I think people start with creating an income for themselves to replace their current income. So they're doing something that they love more, but then the next step is to create like the asset, which is the business that can run on its own. And then, yeah. And then you get, uh, you know, a much bigger return on your investment than just a salary, but sorry, keep going with, uh, um, yeah. With, with so back to your, I guess, Oh, sorry. Back to your original question then about um, like, what are some of the hurdles to get to that goal? Uh, I think I mentioned earlier is just time. Like I can't, there's not enough hours in a day, enough tools to leverage my time to get there. Uh, I am very interested in leveraging my time as much as possible, but to have a saleable systematic business, you eventually have to remove yourself and, you know, there's different ways to get there. Uh, I think a lot of people hire a lot, and hire quickly and then stop working altogether. And uh, there's an author, Mike Michalowicz, in his book, Profit First, he says that often the uh, entrepreneur is the most underutilized employee in the business because they start trying to be McDonald's and writing policies and stuff. But it, there's a certain phase where you should still be contributing your time and energy um, in the, the operations and stuff. Uh, but he also has another like formula in there for hiring where each person in the, that you hire full time should be generating about one hundred and fifty to two hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year. So I think without that model, I probably would have like started thinking about hiring now so I could go do more sales. But knowing that we're we haven't crossed that revenue, um, 
I know that I have a lot of work that I can do with leverage tools to get to that number before I consider an operations manager. I might take on part-time people or, you know, volunteers or interns part-time, but to bring on full-time people, like there's certain uh, financial benchmarks that I think you want to hit before you consider that. Yeah. It, I think the, the way I think of hiring people is like, if, if you can use your time more efficiently and get a higher return on, on your time by leveraging other people's time, then it makes sense. But it's much more complicated than that because with hiring someone, you have to train them. They could leave at any point. There's lots of other factors at play that's just make it more complicated than just a simple like, yes, hire someone if the return is higher than than your hour, like your like you, what you consider your hourly rate to be. Um, it's definitely more complicated than that, but it's a simple model that people can, can, uh, use as well. But, uh, yeah, I think with, with microgreens, it really just depends on what you want, like what every individual microgreens business owner wants for their business. Cause well, like I started, I had no idea I was going to be growing a, like a larger microgreens business. I just thought, you know, I just want to grow more. And then the demand kind of came and then I just kept up with the demand um, as time went on and decided when it made sense to, to expand sort of thing. So, yeah, I, so yeah, I think there's just, there's obviously different phases to every business and there's different times that make sense to hire. So where I'm at now, I'm leveraging my time. Um, and then, yeah, just down the road, it'll make sense to hire people. But I think a lot of times people rush in and, uh, you did mention too, that, you know, you kind of lose time training people and stuff like that. Um, and Dan Martell has a book called Buy Back Your Time. And he says, Hi, don't hire to hire. He's hire to buy back your time. And his like formula is if you can pay somebody 25% of like your hourly rate, do it. <laughs> and that's exactly why I hired a virtual assistant. Um, also inspired by Alex Hermosi's, um like lead getters, he calls them, um, was another reason I did it. But essentially, you know, I brought her on. I took time to train her. Um, but now she does sends invoices. She does some of the prep for me. She sets all of my chef meeting appointments. Um, when I did it, I was terrible. I'd do a bunch and then I'd stop and then I'd get busy doing the meetings and then I wouldn't have meetings for a while. So she sets consistent meetings for me. Um, you know, cause she, I don't, it's, it's her job. So it's easier yeah. for her to just do it. Whereas like, I don't feel like doing it, so I'm not going to do it. Um, so he, anyway, Dan Martell has this hierarchy of like who you should hire. And he's like, everyone should have an executive assistant for all this administrative stuff. Like he even goes as far as like, you shouldn't even check your email or do your calendar. Like they should do that. I haven't gone that far, but that's the, it's, and it's cheap in the Philippines, uh, five to $6 an hour is a livable wage, um, like more than livable. So it doesn't cost very much to hire somebody. I think I uh, pay her like a hundred bucks a week and she does all the, all that stuff for me. Um, but then obviously through the hierarchy, you start to outsource more of your business as far as operations, and sales and all that. So hiring, I think, can look differently um, at different stages of your business. For sure. Yeah. And I think that that's where also with with making training simpler over time, having like guides, just video recording of yourself doing the tasks <clears throat> can be really valuable because then when the next person comes that has to be trained, whether it's replacing that first person or hiring a second person to do, let's say production, um, then you just can refer them to those, to those kind of training videos and then kind of supplement that with your time. So it, it also kind of leverages your time by not having to train them solely on your time. Um, and then I, I found as you have more people in your farm business, more and more people that you've hired early on can train newer people so that less of your time is spent on, on, on that. So that also is, is, uh, uh, another, another benefit of, of just compounding, having more people work as your business gets bigger, uh, uh, to wrap up here, if, if you can go back in time to when you started your farm in January, 2020 and meet the younger version of yourself, what advice would you give him to set him up for success? I think looking back, my perspective of timelines and targets. I, I would shift and make bigger and longer. Um, again, quoting Alex Formosi so many times. He has a podcast about finite games versus infinite games. A finite game is if we go play Monopoly, uh, you win or I win, and it's over. Like, that's a finite game. An infinite game is a game where you uh, win by playing, by never quitting. 
like the longer you play, like you can't lose if you if you don't stop playing. And I think if I had started my farm with not with I need to make this much money to get out of my career that I'm not a fan of. If I had instead said I'm building a 30 year you know, business for myself, I would have made decisions differently along the way. We probably would have pushed through during that you know, traumatic time uh, we had with our family stuff um, to keep it going and continue to grow it. Um, so anyway, I think I've made some shorter term decisions that I would have made longer term decisions had I had a different perspective of the lifetime of this business. That's really great. Yeah, I think that that's that's very helpful for people because I, I think as as human beings, we're just naturally more short term thinking. And like so many people didn't believe in uh, Jeff Bezos when he started because the business Amazon didn't make money for so, so, so long. And 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 uh, Jeff Bezos like had this like really long term thinking mindset, which was so unusual, especially in like the public markets where everyone's considered like how much money are you making this quarter, how much money did you make this week, and and all those kind of KPIs. Uh, but to think longer term, uh, thirty years or even sometimes beyond your life can really shift your perspective in what you want to do with your life, like how you're going to get there, um, and what your actual goals are. And I think that's that's uh, really helpful um, that you said that. For, for people that might be thinking the next two months ahead instead of thinking, you know, the next two, five, 10 years ahead for themselves and their business. Cause it's, it's you get a very, very different perspective. It's the same, it's the same concept as like, you know, when people are, are um, at the end of their life and then they, they, you know, have all these regrets that they didn't do, but they, if they thought about it, um, you know, and, and, and analyze it, they would say, okay, yeah, you know, family is really important. And, uh, time with my kids is really important and things like that. Um, and, you know, most people like realize that money is not everything as an example, um, but that you enjoy what you do. Like, so it, I think it's just having that longer term perspective, I think is really, really helpful, not just from a personal perspective, but also for running a business and what you want to build in the long run. So that, that's really great advice. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it just kind of like scales your, your vision and your goals too. like, there's a book, um, 10x is easier than 2x and they say that a lot of people are focused on like doubling their income or you know uh, but when you start to think 10x you change what you have to do to get there versus just trying to get a little more from where you are now like just i, I don't know it, it just made me realize the more i read about different things like having a bigger vision uh might not get there, but even if we get further than we thought we were going to get based off of having a smaller objective. So uh, it's just different ways to reframe and, and just like, it's crazy how powerful our minds are to like see things differently when you just get an idea like that. And that's why I absolutely love listening to the podcast and audiobooks the whole time I'm doing deliveries. Um, just if I can learn something and shift my perspective, like it can really change your life a lot. Like just, by the mental models and ideas that you intake. Yeah, I totally agree. I think just always being in a space of continuously learning is so, so valuable um, just for personal growth and then also for, for business growth. So you definitely have a growth mindset when it comes to, uh, to business. And I'm excited to see uh, your farm grow over the coming months and years. And uh, I think it's gonna be really cool to watch, watch uh, your progress. Um, but as we wrap up here, if listeners want to connect with you and learn more about you and your farm, where can they find you online and on social media? So primarily I'm on Instagram, uh, even though I do all of my chef outreach on Instagram, I'm terrible at posting. Um, currently, as we record this, my farm is called Desert Kitchen Gardens, um, but we're in the process of rebranding and it will be Ransom Farms. Um, it'll probably be the same Instagram, just with a name change. Um, and then also I do have like a, a blog, I've written a few blog posts on microgreens at home.com. And there's some of my uh, insights on, you know, some of the stuff we talked about today. Awesome. Thanks so much for coming on, Kyle. I think this was, this was great and super informative for myself and I'm sure for everyone listening. So yeah, thanks so much for coming on. All right. Thank you, Jenna. Thanks for tuning in to the Microgreens Mastery Podcast. To access a wealth of insights, just click the subscribe button, stay notified about each new episode, and enjoy all of this wisdom for free. 
If you're ready to supercharge your microgreens business, visit microgreensconsulting.com for a gold mine of guides and resources. We've transformed thousands of microgreens businesses and you're invited to join the success story. Let's stay connected. Follow us on YouTube, Instagram, and TikTok at Microgreens Consulting for exclusive content and expert tips and wisdom. If you found this episode insightful, please leave us a review, spread the word, and let's share Microgreens magic with the world. Until next time, let curiosity fuel your growth and may happiness be your harvest. Happy growing, everyone.